we have a crisis in the world, tremendous crisis, and also crisis in our consciousness, in us. I see the urgency of change, radical revolution, mutation in the mind. I see it. It is necessary. There is complete quietness of the mind, and that which is silent has vast space. Only then that which is nameless comes into being. This is Urgency of Change, the Krishnamurti podcast. Solitude is a lovely word. It implies walking alone, looking, listening, not carrying your troubles, problems and anxieties, being absolutely alone, enjoying. Hello and welcome to episode 216 of Urgency of Change. Each episode of the Krishnamurti podcast features carefully selected clips from our extensive archives. The aim is to represent different aspects of Krishnamurti's radical approach to many of the issues and questions we all face in our lives. This week's theme is solitude. Upcoming themes are opposites, humanity and clarity. This is a podcast from Krishnamurti Foundation Trust based at Brockwood Park in the UK, which is also home to the Krishnamurti Retreat Centre. Situated in the beautiful countryside of the South Downs National Park, the Krishnamurti Centre offers retreats individually and in groups. The focus is on inquiry in light of Krishnamurti's teachings. Please visit krishnamurticentre.org.uk for more information. You can also find our regular quotes and videos on Instagram, TikTok and Facebook at Krishnamurti Foundation Trust. If you enjoy the podcast, please leave a review or rating on your podcast app, which helps our visibility. This week's episode on solitude has six sections. This first extract is from Krishnamurti's second discussion in Sanan, 1978, titled Solitude is not loneliness. What is loneliness? Is loneliness separate from solitude? I'm not quibbling about words. You understand my question? To be alone. is different from being lonely. Uh, alone means all one. I'm using English language. The dictionary says the word alone means all one. See the s- significance of that. Aloneness, solitude, and loneliness. So we are asking, what is loneliness? Have you ever discovered for yourself what is loneliness? Or you have never lived with it long enough to see what it is, or being frightened of loneliness, you move away from it and try to fill that loneliness with amusement, literature, you follow music and yoga, whatever it is. So, there is loneliness, solitude, aloneness. How does this loneliness come about?
You ask that question, madam. Don't take notes while you are discussing. Then you, you and I, I mean, we shan't. You won't be able to pay attention while you are taking notes. Forgive me for pointing it out. That is, most of us are unconsciously or consciously lonely. Right? How does this loneliness take place? How does it happen? Aren't we, in our actions, in daily life, in our relations with each other, acting for ourselves? No? For our selfishness. For we are all the time acting, living, driving, creating, moving from a centre. Our reactions are from a centre. Right? So this constant activity, which is essentially either withdrawal or resistance, must inevitably create this the thing called loneliness. Am I? You understand? Look, I'm married. I'm not. I mean, someone is married, or one has a girl or a boy, whatever it is. Are you really related to that person? Or there is always a barrier, a distance, an interval, a space. I'm using the space in the sense a withdrawal from the other. Right? That is, you are concerned about yourself. Your progress, your success, what you're doing, <coughs> your ambitions, your vanities, your aggressiveness, and so on, so on, so on. Right? And she's also concerned in a different way about that. So, the, how can there be a relationship between the two when each person is concerned about them himself? I wonder if you, huh? it's very simple. That's a fact. Right? Now just a minute, listen carefully. That's a fact. That fact creates conflict. Jealousy, dominance, identification with the other. That identification is part of that desire to avoid, run away from oneself. All that. You've listened to it, haven't you? Now, right? You have listened to it. Have you listened to it? Or you are translating what is being said to your own, in your own terms, you understand? So that you are actually not listening. Therefore, you are avoiding. Avoiding facing the fact that there is this separateness between you and your wife, girl, boy, and therefore there is this constant tension, constant effort, constant struggle. Right? Do you listen to that? Which means, by listening to it very carefully, you are beginning to find out for yourself that this loneliness is a movement 
in which all relationship with another has ended, with nature, with birth, complete isolation. Now, do you see that intelligently? And therefore, the division ceases. I wonder. And therefore, there is no loneliness. Am I? You have understood this. That means actually, don't theorize about it. End it. Then there is the question of solitude, right? Solitude. It's a lovely word. In which is implied, you know, when you are walking alone by in the woods. Hmm? Not carrying all your troubles, your problems, your anxieties. You are just walk, looking at the trees, the clouds, the birds, listening to the birds and running water. Huh? You are absolutely alone. I mean, in solitude you are enjoying. And when you are alone, completely alone, you have left everything behind you. Understand? Your girls, your husband, your wife, your beliefs, everything is down the river. In that aloneness, there is actually, if you have gone very carefully into it, no division. Right? Do you listen to this? Or is it romantic? You know, what a lovely thing that is. Or you have seen the, the enormous danger of loneliness brought about by our own selfish, self centered reaction. If you have seen that, you can go on. You follow. The second extract is from the second question and answer meeting at Brockwood Park in 1979, titled "Will Solitude End Our Confusion?" I have tried all kinds of meditation, fasting and a voluntary, solitary life. But it has come to nothing. Is there one thing or one quality that will end my seeking and my confusion? If there is, what am I to do? You understand this question? Are you in that position? You understand the question? That is, one goes to Japan, Zen Buddhism, Zen meditation, the various forms of Tibetan, Hindu, the Christian, and all the innumerable meditations man has invented. And this big questioner says, I've been through all that. I have done yoga of various kinds, fasted, led a solitary life, trying to find out what is truth. And at the end of it all, I've found nothing. You understand this? You people don't. It isn't a tragedy to you, is it?
Is there one thing, one quality that will end my seeking and my confusion? Is, if there is, tell me what to do. Do you understand the full meaning of this question? I met a man once, he was a very old man, I was quite young, grey hair, almost dying. And he heard one of the talks and came to see me afterwards. And he, spent, he said, I have spent 25 years of my life in solitude, in meditation, I've been married and so on, but I left all that. And for 25 years I meditated. And I see, now that I have heard you, that I have lived in an illusion. You understand? 25 years, you people don't know a thing. And to say to oneself, I have lived an illusion, I have deceived myself. You understand? At the end of twenty-five years to say that. Which means a wasted life, which you are doing anyhow, without being meditating for twenty-five years. And he asks, what is the one thing, one action, one step that will resolve my confusion, the end to my search? You understand the question? Are you in that position, any of you, except the questioner? You understand, you have come to the end of your tether. You have read, you have walked, you have heard, you have cried, you have meditated, you have longed, you have sacrificed. You understand? Probably you haven't done any of those things. And if you have, then what is the one thing that will resolve all this? First of all, don't seek. You understand what it means? Because if you seek, you will find. But you find what you have already sought. I wonder if you see all this. What you will find in your search is what you have projected. You being your priest, your gods, your uh, professor, your Guru, your philosophy, your experience, that projected in the future you will find. Therefore a wise man doesn't seek. And the questioner says, what is the one thing For that one thing, there must be total freedom from all attachment. Mm -hmm. To 
your body, to your exercises, to your yoga, to your own opinions, judgments, and persons and beliefs. Complete freedom from all attachment. Right? Don't make it so- a sorrowful thing, it isn't. There must be no fear. Wait, this is not one thing. Absolutely no psychological fear. And therefore, when there is physical fear, you deal with it. You understand what I am saying? When, when somebody is attacking you, you deal with it. But psychologically, there is no fear. That means no time is tomorrow. No, you don't get all this. And the mind, having understood the nature of sorrow, therefore freedom from sorrow, which doesn't mean that you you are indifferent and all the rest of freedom from sorrow. Right? These are only indications, not the final thing. If these don't exist, the other final thing cannot be. You understand the point? I don't think you do. Look, sir, a man or a woman a man has spent years and years searching, seeking, asking, demanding, so called sacrificing, taking vows of celibacy, poverty, you follow? And at the end of it all he says, My God, I am nothing. I have ashes in my head. Even though they think they have in their hands Christ or Jesus or the Buddha, it is still ashes. I wonder if you see all this. And such a man asks, What is the right action in my life? Right action which will be right under all circumstances. It doesn't vary from time to time according to culture, according to nation, according to education. Right, precise, actual. When all this is clear, that your mind is totally unattached. to itself, you understand, to its own body, and no fear, and the ending of sorrow. Then if that is clear, the one thing is compassion. Understand? Out of all this comes compassion. Then compassion, not ashes in your head. It isn't the compassion that does social reform, social work. The saints, it's in the compassion of the saints. Compassion of the uh, people who go out in the war and heal doctors and so on, so on. It's not that at all. It's the one answer 
that is true under all circumstances and therefore out of that right action. Because compassion goes with intelligence. If there is no intelligence which is born out of compassion, instead, then you get lost in some trivialities. And the world then accepts those trivialities as being the extraordinary acts of compassion. They become saints and they become heroes, they become all kinds of idiotic recognitions of silly people. So there is only there is one act, one quality that is supreme and that is compassion with its intelligence. And out of that intelligence there is a right action under all circumstances. The third extract is from Krishnamurti's fourth talk at Brockwood Park in 1979, titled, Is the Demand for Companionship Born of Solitude? A problem arises when our relationships are not understood, right? whether it is intimate or impersonal. Why have we not understood relationship and see the depth of it or the futility of it and go on with it? But we apparently we are never we have never resolved this problem of relationship. Right? You know all about it, don't you? Why? Is it you love and you are not loved? Is that a problem? Come on, sir, it is. It is a problem. Or you love and the other doesn't love. Right? Or in your relationship with another, you are possessive, you are dominant, you are, you know. Dependent. You want something from her or from him? Sex, pleasure, comfort. As somebody said the other, to me, the other, to the speaker the other day, I need, I, if I live, who will wash my clothes? You understand? I wonder if you understand all this. So what is relationship, out of which we have made such tremendous problem? It is to be related to another. Relationship means related to another, to one or to many or to the whole of mankind, right? To the one or many or to the whole of mankind. You understand? No, you don't. Why is there not in this relationship peace? A depth of understanding of each other. which brings about love. You understand? Why isn't there? The relationship between two people, man and woman, with their sex is called love. Right? Right? Oh, for God's sake! Don't let's be hypocrites, let's face these things. It's called love. And is it love? Or 
is it the demand of sensory satisfaction, the demand of companionship, the demand which is born out of loneliness, the demand that says, I cannot be alone, I cannot stand this immense solitude in myself, therefore I must have somebody on whom I can depend, psychologically all this. You need the postman, the porter, and all the rest of it. But psychologically, in relationship between man and woman, why is there this tremendous division? You understand? And is one aware of this? aware of this great division between you and another, whom you say you love. Did we all go into that? Is it necessary? Apparently it is. All right. Have you noticed between two people their thinking, their feeling are never the same, right? One is ambitious, the other is not. One is aggressive, the other is not. The one is possessive, the other is not. One is dominant and the other is docile. Which means what? Each one is self-centred in his activity, right? Are you following? Observe yourself, self-centred in yourself, and the other two is self-centred. So there is division. So where there is division there must be quarrels, there must be antagonism, there must be all kinds of things going on between nationalities. When there is division there is chaos. Right? And this division we call love. Right? You don't face it. So, in inquiring into something beyond time, one must have, there must be complete sense of relationship, which can only come about when there is love, right? Love is not pleasure, obviously. You cheapen it, right? Love is not desire. Love is not the fulfilment of your own sensory demands. Are you following all this? So, without love, do what you will. Stand on your head, sit in meditation for the rest of your life, cross neck, join, put on fancy robes, do anything you like. Without that quality, you cannot. There is no, there is nothing. So if you want, if this, if the person wants to find something beyond time, he must have, there must be right relationship completely, so that no problems exist. The fourth extract is from Krishnamurti's third talk in Sanan, 1962, titled, Are We Ever Alone? 
We are talking of their psychological acceptances, psychological imitations, conformities. And this conformity is essentially the desire to be secure, never to go wrong, and always seeking success in this world or psychologically, to arrive somewhere. And therefore, obedience becomes extraordinarily important, the acceptance of social, psychological structure of society. Then if one has understood that, then you will find that virtue, the essence of virtue, is aloneness. If you are not completely, totally alone, you are not virtuous. I mean by that word alone, a mind that has understood influence and is not affected by it, is not captured by it, a mind that is no longer seeking power and therefore no longer seeking authority, obedience, following, A mind that is alone from all <coughs> psychological influence, and that word alone is not a reaction, <coughs> it is not an escape from the crowd, it is not becoming a hermit, a withdrawing, living in isolation. Those are all reactions. And I mean by that word alone something entirely different from loneliness. And I'm, it is not the occasion now to discuss, to go into this question of loneliness. We will another time. <coughs> but this quality of aloneness, and it is very difficult to communicate the significance or the meaning of that word to another, to be alone. One is never alone. You may withdraw into the mountains and live a, as a hermit, but you have all the ideas, the experiences, the knowledge and the tradition of what has been with you still when you are by yourself. The monk in a monastery, the Christian monk in a monastery, is not alone. He is, he is with his Jesus, with his, with his Christ, with his knowledge, with his tradition, with his conditioning. And the sannyasi in India who withdraws from the world and, and lives in isolation is not alone. He lives with his memories. I am talking of an aloneness that is totally free from all this. And it's only such a mind that is virtuous. And out of that aloneness there is innocence. <clears throat> Perhaps you will say, that's too much. One can't live like that in this stupid world, earn a livelihood, go to the office every day, have children, wives, nagging, husbands, bullying, and all the rest of it. 
I think it is directly related to life of everyday action. Otherwise it has no value at all what is being said. Because you say, out of this aloneness with its extraordinary virtue which is, which is virile, which has an extraordinary sense of purity and gentleness, it doesn't matter if it makes mistakes, that is of very little importance. But to have this feeling of being completely alone, uncontaminated. It's only such a mind that can go or be aware of something that is beyond the word, beyond the name, beyond all imagination and projection. The fifth extract is from the third question and answer meeting in Sanan 1980, titled What Solitude Reveals. Apparently, we seem to be incapable of standing alone. You know that word alone means all one. When you are really alone, not contaminated, not corrupt because you are attached to something, then you are alone because being free, you are, a, you are that whole human entity, human world. But we are frightened to be alone. We all want to be with somebody, either with a person or with an idea, an image. You know what it means to be alone? It is not solitude which is necessary, it has its own beauty to walk alone in the woods. To walk alone along the river. Not in hand in hand with somebody or other. But to be alone. Solitude. which is different from aloneness. If you are walking by yourself, you are watching the sky, the trees, the birds, the flowers and all the beauty of the earth, and also perhaps you are also watching yourself as you casually watch the woods and the trees and the flowers, you're also casually watching yourself as you're walking along, not having a dialogue with yourself, not carrying your burdens with you, you've left those at your home. So solitude reveals your loneliness your vanity, your sense of depression and so on, so on. And when you have finished with solitude, there is the other, which is not a conclusion, which is not a belief, which is not doing propaganda, telling you what it means to look. That's not propaganda. That's not pushing you in any direction. Because when you are directed, when you are 
guided, then you become a slave and therefore you lose totally freedom from the very beginning. Freedom isn't at the end, at the beginning. Contrary to the communists say that freedom can only be given to the disciplined who know how to live and so on. They are the dictators to tell us how to live. As the gurus and so on do. So we become their slaves. And where there is no freedom, there is no love and truth. The final extract in this episode is from a direct recording by Krishnamurti in Ojai, 1983, titled A Solitude Far From the Noise of Civilization. The other day, as one was walking along a wooded lane, far from the noise and the brutality and the vulgarity of civilization, right away from everything that was put together by man. And here in this quiet, secluded, far away lane, there was a sense of great quietness, enveloping all things, serene, distant, and full of the noise of the earth. As you walked along, quietly, not disturbing the things of the earth around you, the bushes, the trees, the cricket and the birds. Suddenly you round the bend, there were two small creatures quarreling with each other, fighting in their small way. One was trying to drive off the other. The other was intruding trying to get into the little hole, and the owner was fighting it all. And presently the owner won, and the other ran off. Again there was quietness, a sense of deep solitude. And as you looked up, the path climbed, high into the mountains, the waterfall gently murmuring down the side of the path, and there was great beauty and infinite dignity, not the dignity achieved by man, that seems so vain and arrogant. The little creature had identified itself with its hope, as we human beings do. We are always trying to identify ourselves with our race, with our culture, with those things which we believe, with some mystical figure or some saviour, some kind of super-authority. Identity seems to be the nature of man. Probably you have de- derived this feeling from that little animal. One wonders why this craving, longing for identification exists. One can understand the identification with what one needs, physical needs the necessities of the necessary things, clothes, food, shelter, and so on. But inwardly, inside the skin, as it were, we try to identify ourselves with the past, with the tradition, with some fanciful romantic image, a symbol so cherished. 
And in this identification, surely there is a sense of security, safety, sense of being owned and possessing. This gives great comfort. One takes comfort, security, in any form of illusion. And man, apparently, needs many illusions. In the distance, there is a hoot of an owl, and there is a reply from the other side of the valley. There was still door. The noise of the day had not begun, and everything was quiet. There is something strange and holy for the sun arises. There is a prayer, a chant, to the door, to that strange, quiet light. That early morning the light was subdued. There was no breeze, and all the vegetation, the trees, the bushes were quiet, still, waiting, waiting for the sun to arrive. And perhaps the sun would not come up before another an hour, half an hour or so. And the door slowly covering the earth with a strange still. The two hours began to hoot, and then the deep throated voice carried from one side of the hill of the valley to the other. Gradually, slowly, that topmost mountain was getting brighter, and just the sun was touching, golden, so clear, and the snow, pure and touched by the light of day. And as you climb, leaving the little village far down below, the noise of the earth, the quail, the cricket. And the other birds began their morning song, their chant to the, the rich day. And as the sun rose, you are part of that light that left behind everything the thought had put together. You are completely got yourself. The psyche was empty of its confusion, troubles and its pain. And as you walked around, there was no sense of separateness, sense of being even a human being. The morning mist was gathering slowly in the valley, and that mist was you getting more and more thick, more and more the fancy, the romance, the idiocy of one's own love. And after a long period of time, you came down amidst the murmur of many insects to the call of many birds. And as you came down, the mist was disappearing, then there were the usual streets, shop, and the glory of the door, fast fading away. And you began your daily routine, caught in the habit of work, the contention between man and man, the division of identification, the division of ideology, the preparation for the war, your own inward pain, the everlasting sorrow of man. 